start showing the internal systems. What I learned the acronym for system, S-Y-S-T-E-M, what that stands for is save yourself time, energy, and money. So when you have a system, you can save yourself time, energy, and money, which of course are the three biggest commodities for any chiropractor, is how do I become more efficient with my time, having the energy to do all the things in life, and then what you mentioned as well is financially, having the means to not only take the trips, but also what does that do for the income to your practice? Welcome to the Marketing Your Practice podcast, where we guide natural health and wellness experts through the pitfalls of marketing. Each episode, you'll learn simple, effective, easily actionable, and heart-centered marketing strategies. And here's your host, Angus Pike. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, friends. Welcome to the Marketing Your Practice podcast. You're in for a ripper here today. I've got my good friend all the way from the other side of the world, Dr. Brad Glowacki. Brad, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Angus. Pleasure to be here, bud. Dude, it's always wonderful to, um, to chat with you, and I'm excited for our conversation ahead today because it's one of the things I'm most passionate about in terms of how we get better with our communication, how do we get better with our conversion process. So going on today's show, really, gonna, there's two factors to marketing. Factor number one is bringing a whole bunch of new people into your practice uh, so they get to experience your magic. But factor number two is you've got to know how do we turn those people into lifetime patients. We're going to talk all about that today. But Brad, before we get into that, a little bit of a background story for our listeners that might not know of you and your, uh, and your magic. Give us a, a, a thumbnail. So I've been in practice for over 20 years now, a little beach town called Seal Beach in Southern California. It's just south of LA. Uh, it's a cool little surf town. I would say it's kind of like trapped in the 1950s. And when I was going to school, I kind of stumbled upon this town and said, this is where I want to be. This is where I want to do it. And I've lived a couple different places in the US, but I found what I would define as the perfect town to practice in. And uh, when I opened up my doors, I was told that I probably signed a lease in the wrong town because it was in a little beach town. And they said, you can't pull new patients out of the ocean. So, you know, information I could have used yesterday, right? It was like, son of a... So the truth is that first weekend, I got a screening booth at a local surf event. And as surfers came out of the water, those became my new patients. And that kind of became my attitude and practice, which is you can do anything. You know what I mean? I was told, don't open there. You can't pull new patients out of the ocean. And literally my first new patients in practice were surfers out of the ocean. And that's always been my perspective in chiropractic. People need it. They want it. We've got to get in front of them and we've, we've got to do right by them. And then the second wave comes, which is referrals and families and just building a fun family practice. So um, I'm married. My wife and I have four awesome kids. Oldest is 17. She's about to go off to university and I've got some definite mixed feelings about that. And my youngest is 10. So we've got two boys, two girls, busy practice, love teaching. And I get to meet cool people like you all over the world within the profession. So it's been a blast. Mm. I got a bunch of uh, mentors in my life. I, I don't have one person I like to kind of take bits and pieces. There are two things that from the very first moment that I really admired about you. Um, one of them is innovation. And we'll talk about that too. And the other is your ability to take a holiday. So uh, I have aspirations. So yeah, we we're talking a little bit before this. Last week you had how many weeks holiday? Yeah, last year we took uh, 12 weeks of family holiday. And as a minimum, it's eight weeks every year for us. Yeah. So for most of our listeners, I want you to kind of just think about how could you be consistently taking eight weeks holiday? And for many of you, you go, man, how could I afford that? And then how could my practice afford that? We're going to solve a lot of that for you today because there are good marketing in terms of being able to predictably attract in really good, high quality people and then knowing what to do with them solves that completely. So, you know, when Brad is off traveling around and sharing his message and holidaying and skiing and surfing, you know, there's uh, practitioners in his practice, he's got other chiropractors in there that follow a system. We'll talk about that system today that's reproducible, that's implementable, that allows him to do those kind of things. So our goal today for this session is, is really to show you how to kind of head in that direction. Does that sound fair? Yeah, I love it. And it's what we call 360 success. You know, it's not that not that I have success in all areas of my life, but I'm always cognizant of it. So it's not, you know, practice success or family success or, or time with your kids. It's like, no, it's, it's an and conversation. It's practice success and you can make your sons lacrosse games. You know, it's practice success and having time to go to the gym for yourself. So really being cognizant that there's more to being a chiropractor than just your statistics in the practice. 
Yeah, I think that's an important conversation because we go, there are too many ores across, you know, I'm going to build a practice that's built on just internal referrals. I'm not going to do that advertising stuff or, you know, I can, you know, I'm not one of those chiropractors that's there in practice all the time. I'm a family man or woman. And, and right. too often we're limiting ourselves because it's not, as you said so beautifully, it's, it's not an all game. It's an end game. You can have them both. You're doing a great job of it also. So yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. So let's lay a framework out. What we're going to really talk a lot about today is really uh, visit one, visit two, day one and day two as well. So, you know, you've done a great job. You've uh, attracted a bunch of new patients in the practice. In fact, if we take a step back, because for a long time you have, when we talk about innovation, you've really taught, you know, practitioners, chiropractors around the world, how to go out into businesses, how to do powerful lunch and learn type sort of talks that then leads to the floodgates opening and a bucket load of new patients coming in. And then you were getting feedback from people saying that didn't work for my practice. So take us back to that and then let's unwind into talking about day one. Yeah, it was just funny because we had people that would say, you know, I, I applied your material and I got 15 new patients, but it just wasn't profitable. And I went, what do you mean? Like, how do you not make that profitable? And the short version is basically a lot of them were, were not doing care plans. They were doing pay as you go. And as I like to say, that means that they rarely pay, but they always go. You know, so you're driving all these new patients and then they stick around for two or three or four visits. And the worst part about that for me is that they would say things like, I tried chiropractic once and it didn't work. And I just went, oh, it's not a try it once. And, you know, it's, it's like having a toothache and saying, I brushed my teeth, didn't, didn't help out. It just makes no sense to me. Why would you go once? You know, it's like going to the gym once. I didn't get, I didn't get stronger or leaner. It, it doesn't work that way in the physiology. So part of it was frustration, to be honest. And then kind of what you said in the, in the two things is the innovation. You go, look, there's a better way to do this. And part of what I had going on in my practice um, I didn't really teach it. And I just said, I'm going to start showing the internal systems. What I learned, the acronym for system, S-Y-S-T-E-M, what that stands for is save yourself time, energy, and money. So when you have a system, you can save yourself time, energy, and money, which of course are the three biggest commodities for any chiropractor, is how do I become more efficient with my time, having the energy to do all the things in life, and then what you mentioned as well is financially, having the means to not only take the trips, but also what does that do for the income to your practice? So kind of putting all those pieces together and the innovation of where that fits in has been a lot of fun, really basing it on sound communication, and ultimately bring it back to that word of value. Yeah. So a reminder, gang, the job of our marketing really is to get us that first date. And then the job of that first date is to get us a second date. And then the job of the second date is to get us a third date. But if you, know, if you do a great job with your marketing and someone says, yes, I'll meet you for a coffee uh, and you're a slob, then that's what so many of us are doing. You know, when we talk about our kind of practice multipliers and number one is this is be great at what you're doing. So let's talk about the initial consultation. What, with regards to the system inside of this, because you have a program where you teach a lot of this stuff called elements. I like the idea that you, you know, it's like the periodic table where there are elements of success and the concept of it being a system, which means it's implementable by anybody. This is not just built on somebody that has this incredibly magnetic and attractive personality like you do. You know, it's, it's, you know, it can be done by, so what are the elements of a great initial consultation? Yeah, so I think number one, I've, I've discovered some, I think some mistakes just from hearing chiropractors and I teach a multiple continents every year and it, it kind of blows my mind like some of the things docs are doing um you know they do things like office tours to begin with they get somebody in and they walk them around the office and they show them you know paintings of bj palmer and their library of the green books and they do all these things and i just go why would you do that like a dentist doesn't feel the need to show them you know the entire office uh medical doctors need to do that they talk about themselves in terms of their specialties their degrees and so just kind of getting some of the mistakes out of the way too, I think has been huge. Just going, don't do that. You know, we had one doc say, I give an office tour. We have a painting of BJ. My sister did it. She's kind of an artist, not really. And then we light candles to it every morning. And what do you think of that? And I said, I think that's weird. Don't do that. It's just like, that's how you start your exam. No, that's weird. Don't, don't be doing that. And then the truth is on the day one, ultimately to be doing this right, 
It's about the word value. And I think that gets thrown around loosely, but um, day one of practice, I spoke to my father and I said, look, I need a good pep talk. I'm about to open the doors of my new business. I'm pretty nervous. What do you got for me, dad? And he said, in the absence of value, cost is the only consideration. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of looking for something different at the time, but you know, with some wisdom, I figured out that was actually some phenomenal advice. If I don't drive value in my day one process, there is no second date, like you said. So if you show up for coffee and you appear to be a slob, there isn't that second date really ever going to happen. So on the day one, it's all about building value. It's all about a you-centered statement. And it kind of goes back to like Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. The more you get them talking about themselves, then the more they actually like you and they like your process and they like what you're doing. If somebody meets, if a doc watching this were to go in and meet a patient this afternoon, and I want this to be usable all the way through the, the interview today, if they go in and they meet someone this afternoon that is a new patient, and let's say that new patient was referred in, we all know if you pay a compliment to the person who referred him in, Mary sent you in, I see that she, is that right? Great. We love Mary. Mary's great. One of the coolest things in that first minute that you're doing is you're initiating the law of transference. In other words, whatever I say about Mary immediately reflects back on me. And chiropractors have done this for years. A lot of times they don't know the benefit of doing that, but that's called transference. And it's part of building rapport. If somebody on their intake form writes down that their name is William because that's their official name, but they prefer to be called Bill, you can no longer call them William. You know what I mean? Like you have little things that will build rapport through the day one process are huge. And ultimately, the bigger the value on the day one, the easier it becomes in your report of findings. So the more value you can build through your day one procedures, then honestly, the easier it is for people to say yes when it comes to your care and your recommendations. Mm. One of my pet peeves with this, uh, just before Christmas, I actually did a podcast episode where I was talking about, went along to a Chinese med practitioner to get some acupuncture. And, you know, it was so nice to be on the other side of things. So I, you know, I had a couple of pages of forms to fill out. It was nice forms, wasn't too many questions. You know, I really clearly explained why I was there. It had questions around my lifestyle, what supplements I was taking, all that kind of stuff there too. And then I sat down with my practitioner um, and immediately she asked me all the same questions that I'd already filled out on the piece of paper. And I'm like, why did I even fill this in? You you know, that goes back to that concept that said, look, if if I said my name is William, but I like to be called Bill, then call me Bill. And if you're making uh, uh, paperwork, that you're expecting your patients to fill out and then you're sitting them down and you're asking all those questions. It's a great opportunity once you've bonded with somebody, say, hey, I see that Mary sent you in here. She's ter-, you know, that kind of stuff there too. Yeah. You can then sit down and say, hey, Brad, man, I've seen that you've been having headaches for the last three months. You know, at their worst, they're like an eight out of 10. It's got to the stage where you're no longer able to play golf on the weekend. Buddy, that sounds terrible. Tell me more about that. Like that's a, that's a game. It's not difficult, but you talk about value. Is that the kind of thing that you're suggesting that that we can do? Without a doubt. Yeah. So even going back to the intake forms, look, if you've got more than three pages, it's too much. If you're not going to do some kind of a recap and you're not going to do some kind of a quantifiable summary that you've paid attention, it's what we call active listening. So if I'm not going to repeat back what I currently know, I'm not going to repeat back at certain stages, um, then it gives the impression that you're not paying attention. So if it is written, I see that you said this and I see that you have this, what else? And that would be appropriate because then you're summarizing what they wrote, you validate that effort, and then you can move on. So there's little things in the day one that often escape docs. And And this is also why I teach that you lose money on a day one, but you'll actually make it in your report of findings. So a lot of people just kind of rush through the day one. You can't do that. It's gotta be loaded with value. We do Socratic questions that actually draw the right information from the patient, but you can educate them in the process. And then the golden rule really when it comes to influence is just stay in agreement. You know, Mm -hmm. stay in agreement. So if they say something like, you know, I have, you know, back pain and it's creating these headaches, but I know chiropractic doesn't do anything for this or that. You just kind of have to stay in agreement through the process and you keep your gunpowder dry until it's time to really go through the plan. And these are all little intricacies that a lot of times I'll see docs make mistakes with and they elicit some biases that they don't even know they're doing it. So a good example would be somebody comes in for a problem and they say they went to their GP, they went to their medical doctor, they were given pills and drugs. Well, Angus, between you and I, 
what's the possibility that somebody saw their GP or their medical doctor before they tried a chiropractor most of the time? Would you say that's a pretty high probability that they would basically see the family doctor or try something else? And sometimes, unfortunately, we're like one of the last resorts, right? Yeah, that's so a nine out of 10. Yeah, absolutely. So rather than attacking that action step and eliciting something called a confirmation bias where we say, you should have gone to your MD, that's a bad idea. All they do is work for the pharmaceutical companies. And I have friends that do this stuff. And I go, ooh, that's like so taboo in communication. You elicit a confirmation bias. You make them wrong for a past action, which actually means they're less likely to make a future action step with you because you basically attack them on what they've already done. So even better is just to stay neutral or what the advanced chiropractor does is you congratulate them. Good. I'm glad you checked it out. In other words, they wouldn't be in your practice if they found a solution to the problem, right? So as a marketer, you would know the number one buying signal when someone's in your office is that they're in your office. Yeah. The the number one buying signal is they're there. Your job at this point is to stay in agreement, build value through the process, and don't attack them if they saw the medical doctor. Pay attention to the things that they're telling you. Give frequent summaries. Let me make sure I got this right. This episode has been going on for two weeks, but it actually started two years ago. Is that right? Yeah, that's right, Doc. Hmm. And you can do nonverbal cues to that. It's like, geez, that sounds bad. And I didn't really even say anything, but you can give these cues through the process that people will pick up on it. And and ultimately they know that this is something that they're they're in the right place and they leave feeling like they're gonna find a solution to that problem. Yeah. I find it interesting that sometimes when we have our our, our practitioner hat on and we're sitting down knee to knee and we're taking a history that we forget completely what it's like to be a human being. Like if I was sitting down with you and we were having a, a coffee and you were telling me, man, I've just, I've had this blistering headache this last 10 days. You know, I, I would acknowledge that and show some form of empathy where I'm like, dude, that sounds horrible. But yet we don't, we just keep on writing. So when, you know, I train my staff, if they have a new patient on the phone there that says, you know, I want to see if I can come in to see one of your docs, I've got this going on. They stop and they go, wow, that sounds terrible. Okay. You're in the right place. We see that all the time and we get great results. Let's get you in with Dr. Kirby as soon as we can, but stop and acknowledge it like you would a real human being. Not, right. we, we become a little bit, um, you know, uh, immune to this kind of thing because we hear people telling these stories all the time and we know that, hey, just hang out with me for a few weeks and you're going to be better. Like we know that that's the future that's coming for them. So therefore we don't stop and get present. And in another way of that, of getting in agreement, of showing empathy, letting them know that that we know how they feel. That the number one reason that people leave health practitioners and the research I've seen is they don't feel heard. And, and that's what you're doing all on that visit number one is making sure they feel heard. You hit on so much. It's so key. So I like to teach from three, uh, the three piece. One is your philosophy, your belief system. And this is why the material I love to share is great for vitalistic chiropractors because within vitalism, we have room for mechanism. Within a vitalistic philosophy, there's room to also see chiropractors for back pain. So it works for any type of chiropractor. The philosophy that I like to work with is that the body's self-healing, self-regulating, but then the procedures need to match that because the minute there's an incongruence or there's not a consistency there, then we have an immediate breakdown. So if the philosophy is one thing, but the procedures are another, that isn't going to work long term. And exactly what you're saying is so key. And I hope the listeners pick up on this is that the number one emotion in sales, whether it's marketing or going through your day one, day two process of getting people to say yes to longer term chiropractic is empathy. So where the philosophy would then meet the procedure is if somebody calls and says, I have a headache or I have back pain, it's the same thing for the docs in the consultation room. You have to give what we call a negative acknowledgement. That's terrible. So it's a negative word, but we're acknowledging with it. Mm. That's terrible. Sorry to hear that. Gosh, that must be awful. And it's not dramatization, but you need to acknowledge it because the number one emotion in sales, the most penetrating emotion is empathy. Sympathy is like, you poor bastard. You know, it's just like sympathy is different. It's like, I'm glad it's you and not me. Empathy is you feel for them and you go, geez, that's awful. Tell me more about that. And so that procedure that you mentioned, even on the phone is so consistent. The belief is we've got to really check in and not be desensitized. The procedures you give that negative acknowledgement 
and, and make those people feel heard. And you're right, the number one reason people leave a doctor is the indifference that they feel, almost like the doctor doesn't care anymore. We just get too callous to it. So there's so much, even in that initial part, when docs are doing their consultation, and they say, I've had headaches for two weeks, it's blinding pain, I can't sleep, I'm just hoping I can get some relief today. You have to acknowledge that emotion and go, wow, I'm so sorry to hear that. You know, this is awful, that must be terrible. I can't believe you've gone two weeks well, and the minute you feel heard, there's a decision-making phenomenon. Within the first three minutes, people will decide if they like you, they will decide if you're credible, and they're going to decide if they want to do something with you. Mm. We've also experienced a negative scenario where no matter what they say after that third minute, we've already decided if it's like a, you know, a cheese ball salesman or someone that's wearing clothes or something that you just dislike or there's a thing about them that no matter what they have to offer you, within the first couple minutes, you just go, you know, this this doesn't feel right. I'm just not going to do it. And we've also had that occurrence as well. So it's really important for chiropractors in particular to make eye contact, to write the things down, to give summaries of what's going on. And and the truth be told, on the day one, it's pretty boring, right? Most chiropractors just kind of blow through it. But you can also ask some really valuable questions that will set you up on your day two. And I'll give you a golden question docs can use right away. Mm. The end of your day one, probably the most important question is just setting up some consistency going into your day two. And the question, if it fits, and again, only if it fits, but if somebody's had an issue going on for years, I like to look at them and just say, look, from what you've told me, this, 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 and you kind of list it back so there's that active listening going on. You realize, John, that this is going to take more than a single visit to get this corrected, right? There's been a lot of stuff going on here after I've just listed it back to them. This is going to be more than one visit, right? And that's called a contrasting question. And so quite often what will happen is they go, oh, yeah, I know it's going to take more than one. When we take off one side of the scale, then it actually moves them to the other end of the scale, which is multiple visits. But also, if we do that at the end of a day one, it sets up the law of consistency, which essentially people want to stay consistent with what they told you and they don't want to contradict themselves. So then if we fast forward into the report of findings, the day two, whatever you call it in your office, the doctor's report, um, there's that law of consistency working for you, which is people hate to contradict themselves. So when we say it's going to take 12 visits or 36 visits or whatever it is that you want to do, um, you've already got some momentum going that direction. And that momentum has been laid on their words, not something you told them, but on something they told you. So there's a real Socratic way we can kind of get them off the pain model into a vitalistic model, but make it their idea. The whole time, it's got to be their idea. And that way, it's not something where the doc is pushing and grinding. I affectionately say we create buyers. You know, we, we want to create people that want the service, not that you're forcing it against their will. And it starts with empathy. It goes through making people feel heard, not redundant, uh, and really validating it. And then once you get the basis of what you need, you can do some things like the law of consistency. And you can really set some things up so your report of findings is a much easier, more fluid process. Yeah. I think I like that concept you talked about. Because often, you know, I know we're talking a lot about pain, which is, you know, far from the only thing that we're dealing with as as chiropractors. But if somebody feels like they hurt their back this morning when they're tying their shoelace up and the problem started four hours ago, it would kind of make sense to me that maybe you should be able to just kind of crack me and I'll be out of pain this afternoon. Part of a good history, not only, you know, and helping, part of a good history is finding out what stresses have been on their life over their life, not just what happened this morning. And if you don't connect those dots for people and, you know, whether it be just as simple as saying, listen, man, you've been tying your shoelaces every morning for the last 40 years. Like, why now? Why do you think it happened this morning? You know, then you start to find out that things have been stressful at work. It's a, gen- it's a genuine question too, isn't it? Like, why today? It is. I mean, this I've is always not- wondered, like why? like, why now? And the truth is, because usually it attacks their self-efficacy. And this is where kind of the material goes to a different level because somebody who is a mom and has to do things with their kids, that's how they define themselves. And the minute the shoelace episode interrupts their self-efficacy, how they define themselves, we're working on a whole different level. And that's where the seriousness comes into it. And not to complete your thought for you, but I think where you were going with that, and I, I jumped in because I'm hyper, but where you're going with that is chronicity becomes your friend. 
Yes. And quite often I see vitalistic chiropractors go, I don't want to talk about the pain. I don't want to deal with that. And truth be told, if you don't at least address it appropriately, they're always going to sabotage you with it. So you're better off to handle it quite easily. And then how we do this with wellness patients is even easier because quite simply, what do you, what do you need to be doing better? You know? and, and so our wellness exams are super fast. We do attract those patients in the office. But what chiropractors don't know, specifically chiropractors, is that quite often it's the pain-based patients that they're really screwing it up. And if they have a problem, you need to go beyond what we call the episode, and you need to find out how long it's been going on ever, right? So it's ever versus the episode. When was the first time you ever had this problem as opposed to this morning tying my shoe? Mm -hmm. But you're exactly right. And quite often it isn't that they couldn't tie their shoe. It wasn't even the pain because they probably had it somewhere in the past as well. It's the fact that it attacks who they are. I'm a police officer and I need to do things like a cop. And if I can't, now that's a problem. I'm a golfer. I need to golf. And if I can't, that's a problem. I'm a mother. And if I can't do things that a mother does. So that's really where the value comes in. And you have to train your ear to listen for it. The docs have to train themselves to go, ah, that's really what it's all about. That's what I need to pull into my day too. And, and that you're a genius and, and team me up on this because that really is the goal. If you can really uncover that routinely, I'm going to tell you that becomes part of the connection to the eight weeks of family time and vacation, because yeah. you can train your team members, you can train your associates and quite simply, you don't need to be in the office to do these things. It becomes reproducible. It, come, it becomes predictable at the results, which is why I can do it from another continent. It's really fun to see that. But you have to know what makes people tick. And a lot of it is that self-efficacy. It's an attack on who they are. And if you listen to somebody like Eckhart Tolle, they'll talk about, you know, everybody has an ego and, and that really can work against you. But at the same time, that ego and that label we give ourselves comes with a lot of pressure. And if we don't meet our expectations for ourselves, there is not an easier person to put face down on your table because they want it. Not because I forced them or I manipulated them mentally to do that. It's because deep down they need to get back to doing what they see themselves doing and chiropractors just need to be trained how to listen for that. Yeah. Brad, one of the concerns that I often hear when I'm talking with docs about this kind of stuff is, man, that kind of initial consultation is going to take me 60, 90 minutes. How long does it take to do and achieve all of those goals when, when you get good at it? It's always under 10 minutes. Yeah. It's always under 10. And that's top to bottom with someone that we would, you know, it's kind of like your, your great aunt that just rambles on and just keeps talking. Even with those people, uh, you can get it in under 10 minutes. It's just, it's right there. It's a matter of honing in on the questions, doing it Socratically and just not allowing those Sometimes you have a catastrophizer. You know, those are the people that just kind of ramble and ramble. Um, those are easy because you can redirect those, but it's the people that have to be unpacked. It's the people that are guarded that you really have got to get pointed with your questions to basically unpack them and they kind of protect the information. Those are the ones that I think docs need the most work with. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I, I mean, I might be a bit slow. I reckon it takes me about 15, but I'm an Aussie. So, uh, you know, we're, we're a little slow. In, it, in New York, it's six minutes. That's all it takes. In, in yeah, it's, it's, like it's an easy process. Hey, let's transfer from there into day two, the report of findings. And there'll be some listeners here that even, I, I was amazed, even the concept of a report of findings, a, a what? Like I don't just do one visit and get started. What are our goals of our report of findings? What are we trying to achieve with that? And again, what are some of the mistakes that docs make in their report of findings? I would say this, even if you do the report of findings on the same day you did the exam, just put some time between the two things. There's, there's a lot to do with framing. And if I adjust somebody and then I spin around to tell them what I just did, that would be like post framing. I would try to tell them after the event happened, you've, they've already lost their attention. There is no interest. And those are two key elements to really educating people because they're paying attention. Um, so you have to pre-frame. So in order to pre-frame it, going back to time, if we try to do that within the consult, within the exam, some docs watching this may take x-rays or do other testing that will add time. If you then add your findings onto the back end, we're talking about a 90-minute visit. It's just not it's not good for the patient. It's not good for your practice. So rule number one is I always split the exam and consultation with what we call a report of findings, a doctor's report, a day two. It's your chance to lay out the plan for the patient. And we do plans. So for me, 
if you adjust them on visit one, three things are gonna happen. None of them are good for the doc. One, they feel better. Why do I need a plan, right? Two, they feel nothing. Why do I wanna do a plan based on nothing, right? Three, maybe they have a little soreness or a little retracing or they hurt a little bit, kind of like going to the gym the first time, you can be sore. Why would I sign up for more of that? So until you pre-frame it, you don't want those three things happening. Mm -hmm. Then when you pre-frame it, you say, this is gonna be a process, this is what we're gonna do, here's what it's gonna look like, and if you agree to those terms, then let's just get started, okay? If not, then the agreements and expectations have to be upfront. But what I love to do with the report of findings, and again, this is something people watching this can use this right away. You can plug this in today, and for that, we would have we would have helped their practices tremendously, specifically for social media and online reviews. And what we do is we pre-frame it and say, look, I, I can help you out. These are things that we work with, and I know you're going to do great in here. The timeline, everybody's different, but I just want to remind you, you can say no to my recommendations. And I'm telling you, Angus, if we cut this call right here, buddy, that would be gold for people. Because when you say you can say no, they could always say no. But when you remind them, you can say no. And we, and we build it into what we teach. It's basically, I, I, I think the term scripting gets a bad rap. So I'm going to call it a recipe. And we give it to docs word for word. But when you get better at the recipe or the script, it becomes a template. And when you get good at the template, it really just kind of becomes innate. And I'd like to come from that place of just going, hey, look, innately and honestly, you can say no. And what you do is you do something really important called a return of autonomy. So you honor that it's a quote unquote sales process. You honor the sensitivity that we're going to talk about time and money and the energy to come in. And I just want to let you know, you can say no. When you return autonomy, it drops the guard of the patient and it honestly changes everything. So if you can do that simple thing after this call uh, and your listeners can just start their finding and say, I'm going to go over what I found and we get great results with that in this office or I wouldn't have you here. But I got to remind you, you can say no to my recommendations. And then the second part of that, is that, is that cool with you? Is that okay? However they want to say it. And they go, yeah, okay. The second part is the most important part. You just say, I just don't want you feeling pressured. And as soon as you can drop that, and you're the social media guru, you know how to drive people in offline. Um, it's huge, right? Because honestly, what it does is it eliminates negative online reviews. And you know this better than anybody. People are going to be checking reviews. They're going to be checking your status in the community. It's more important going forwards that we eliminate some of the negative stuff. So we set chiropractors up for more success. Yeah, so as soon as you, say, you can say no, I just don't want you feeling pressured after they give you the affirmation. You can say no. You know that, right? Right. Okay. I just don't want you feeling pressured. As soon as you do that, I'm telling you, the social media stuff and the negativity goes away. Yeah, there's a couple of really powerful things. I love that concept. One, you're going to massively decrease the chance of there being buyer's remorse, where someone right. feels like they've been painted into a corner and you want to annoy people, then start pressuring them into things. Now, they might come for an adjustment five or 10, but this is not how we kind of create a raving fan. We want people with that idea of autonomy where they're, you know, choosing and, and, and by laying that out on the table there too, such a powerful statement that says, because there's something really nice about a takeaway too. I was chatting with my daughter this morning. I've got a 19 year old daughter. We're chatting about dating and relationships and how, just neediness is terrible. Nobody likes somebody that's needy. And if we can step back from a patient and say, listen, I've got the prize, whether you take it or not, it's got nothing to do with me. I can help you. If you want to come along and be a part of this practice, we'd love to help you. But this is about you, not about me. That idea of, of the takeaway and part of what you've done there before is so damn attractive mm -hmm. as opposed to you know, when we're pushing somebody into the corner, we look needy. Now, you know, some of you might be very skilled at forcing people into a decision that's better for you than is for them. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell you now, it's not a great thing. It's not what builds the practice that Brad is talking about, where you can take eight weeks holidays, where you're getting great reviews online, where after they come and see you, they're then going back to their husband or wife or saying, man, you got to go and see Brad. You know, right. that we don't want to refer somebody to a doc who we know that's going to put the same pressure on you know, my buddy, as you did on me. So yeah, great right. strategy. Yeah. And it's, it's huge. I think too, just uh, from that standpoint that ultimately where I'd like to get the chiropractors that are watching this is a wellness practice, 
-hmm. And if you can handle the pain conversation on day one, make people feel heard, be different in that you're genuinely interested, you're showing the emotion, the empathy word that you brought up is huge. Carrying that sentiment into the day two, it's just a real soft place you're coming from. It's a heartfelt message. You just go, hey, look, I got the prize, like you said, and I can help you. I just don't want you feeling pressure. It's really important how they feel through the process. It completely disarms them. And then whatever you say after that, in that pre-frame moment, it, it's so important that when people say no to your care plans, and I teach on different continents how to get people to say yes to a care plan. And I want to be really obvious in each place that I go that it isn't too American because I think the American stereotype is push, sell, grind, get them to say yes, no matter what. And I don't resonate with that. So if somebody does, great. There's people out there doing that. I'm just not one of them. I'm not one of those people that want you to push and grind. Let them enjoy the process. Let them, and if they say no, it's really important that we also have procedures where they leave with their dignity that they can say no to your plan, walk out of your practice, and they feel good about that too, because then the door's always open, and this is big in marketing, right, is, is not guilting people out of the business, but always keeping it open so they're always welcome back. That's how you build, honestly, a strong wellness practice. It's not about getting the yes through the initial care plan. I want them for wellness care through life, but we gotta get through that first phase and then we can get into that second phase. And I said a really cool experience. I had uh, James Chestnut sit through a two day of, of what we teach and, and just say, look, this is the best thing for wellness because of the way you teed up in the beginning, we can get people beyond it. And, and all parts really need to be working together. And we're in a super savvy world. You know this better than anybody, Angus. Online reviews matter. Online searches matter. Different forms of medium, whether you know it's Yelp, Google, Facebook. I mean, there's so many ways that people are investigating the service that you give. Um, you want it positive, and, and I think one of the best things you can do is just say, "Hey, look, if you say no, that's cool too." And if they feel that sincerity, they're actually more likely to say yes because they don't. We do, we don't put up that wall of resistance. You know, we don't push back on that. And I think that's really important as a way to disarm it. Mm. We touched on this earlier on in the interview. One of the things that you're passionate about is not having people pay as they go each and every visit. Why is that? Because on the flip side of that, the other thing that, that you're really not a fan of is yearly care plans too. So where's the happy medium inside of that? And, and why are you such a fan of, of having people buy blocks of adjustments or, or pay in advance? One is, I mean, you got to look at the 33 principles of chiropractic and how the body heals and what the body does. And, and one of those principles is it's going to take time. And you can apply that same principle to losing weight, to getting stronger in the gym. Things just don't happen overnight in the body. It's time and repetition, like lifting weights, like um, working out. I mean, there's so many things that it is time and repetition based. Having said that, I think one of the ways that chiropractors specifically have been taught to increase their PVA is just to start adding visits to their initial care plans. So selling 60 visit plans, 80 visit plans, it is a hard sell. And, and unfortunately, what I'm seeing, because I teach a lot of docs and I get a lot of feedback at workshops, that the people aren't even there at the end of those longer care plans to go into a wellness phase. So it's totally ironic, but the docs that don't want to talk about pain, so they sell them longer care plans, they only stick around for the pain phase of the care. So they go to 40 or 50 of the 80 visits they've been sold. Then they just drop out of care and they're not even there to be re-signed into a wellness model. They don't even get the option to do it. So unfortunately, the docs that don't want to talk about pain, all they ever do is see their patients for pain. And then the docs that don't like to talk about money so they don't do care plans. Unfortunately, they're always selling the next visit at the table or at the bench. And so there's this, this crazy paradox that exists. If you don't like talking about money, talk about it once, put them on a plan, and then you never talk about it again. And in our office during adjusting hours, it's high fives, hugs, knuckle jives. You know I mean? It's just fun. Like my practice is fun because we've agreed to the money. And then when it's adjusting time, I'm either the healer or the banker. But I don't mix those energies in my hours. I don't mix those energies with my patients. I set aside one time to do one thing and another time to do another. And it makes it really fulfilling to be in practice and to see a good number of people that it's not exhausting. Yeah, I love in the early days. I, I was super selfish about this. In the early days, I used to do yearly plans. 
you actually can't even do them here in Australia now. But the number one reason I stopped is like, I, I didn't want to commit to them for 12 months. I, you know, I've always had, you know, a, a high fence up about who I want to work with. Like, I don't know if I want you in my practice, you know, two or three times a week for the next 12 weeks or whatever it is and be working with you in 12 months. Like we might not get along at all. And I want to practice full of people that I like because that's who I do the best work with. Right. So that was the number one reason for me that I brought it right back down. I went, you know, let's test each other out from here. But at the same time, let's make it easy on my staff at the front desk. Let's make it easy on you as well. You and know, quite honestly, they're, they're thinking the same thing, right? Like, I don't know where I'm going to be in a year. I don't know if I'm going to like you that much. I mean, it's a real legitimate argument on both sides, doctor and patient. And, and for docs that are doing that, I think that's also why it's key for burnout. Yeah. Right. Because then sometimes you put people in the plants and now you've got to see them. And anytime you have to do something in your practice, you've accepted a debt. Yeah. And the, the, the key point is here is that I'm still saying to the patient, so I'd still be saying, hey, Brad, you know, what? I think this is going to take us the very best part of the next 12 months to get you back to where you need to be. Okay, so I want to get an agreement there so we understand up front our time frame. And then I will go into, you know, let's start with our first 10, 20, 30 adjustments from there too. You can fix, you know, so then we go into those small bite sized pieces. Again, it's a dating process. I think now skepticism across the board, whether you're going for a haircut, whether you're going to a lawyer, it's all time high. And if you're asking somebody up front for 12 months commitment with their cash, um, that's going to be a roadblock, gang. That's going to really impact, you know, your conversion rates for people staying on for you. So, I, I, you know, I couldn't agree more with your process. Hey, Angus, just so you know, this is like perfect, like uh, audio watermark for these interviews because my practice is right next to a fire station. So nobody would believe that I'm doing this in my office if we didn't have some sirens. So I just want to let you know that it just makes it an official interview right now. It's like if, if we didn't do a Glowack interview with sirens, people would question it. But no, you, I mean, you're spot on with all of this stuff. Um, the, the savvy consumer is only getting smarter. And the tools that they're using in things like retail, not, not in healthcare yet, but in retail, they'll consult their phone 80% of the time before they bring an item to the register. People are going to be getting more savvy as time goes on. And so it's really important to understand the agreements, understand. So that time thing of a year, but let's pull it back into this. That's also a form of framing, right? It's, it's a time framing. And, and part of what docs need to know is it, you've always got agreements of time before money. That's like a sales rule. You know, you have to get the time established before the money because you might need to adjust the time if someone's schedule doesn't permit. So it's always time before money, but you always pre-frame time longer and then pull in your recommendations shorter. And the way we describe that is you've got to make your recommendations under the patient's expectations. Mm. So just what you said is brilliant. We, we might take us a better part of a year. So their expectations are a year, but I'm going to recommend under that. And when you can do that, again, these are all points that it just takes pressure off the dock. You create buyers who love the outcome as opposed to forcing the sale against their will. So always for your listeners, make your recommendations under their expectations. And the only person that really drives their expectations is you. So the things you can say and ask that will push up their expectations. And then when you make your care plans underneath it, it's kind of like, oh, of course I can do that. I can do the 10, 20, 30 visits that you mentioned because I thought it was going to take a full year. Yeah, I can agree to a bite size. And that's how we're going to get bigger and higher conversions for chiropractors, which ultimately, in my opinion, keeps people away from the pills and the drugs and all that negative stuff. Yeah, I think we've got to remind ourselves what this is all about. And, and while on one hand, I'm all for you having a thriving practice that just collects bucket loads of cash. But remember, the, the product at the end of it is a really healthy community. Ultimately, that's really what it's about. When your community yeah. wins, you win there also. Lots of these elements, what's kind of really neat about it is our good friend, Martin Harvey. And you guys have worked really hard. Like, this is all based really strongly in the social sciences of what helps to lead people, not to manipulate them, gang, but what helps to lead people to the result that they want? I think that's really important. You have a two-day event where you dive deep into this. There's 50-page-plus manuals, that's whole kind of stuff there too. Can you tell us a little bit about, because I'm hoping there's a bunch of our listeners now like, oh, man, I, I, I can improve on this. This is what I've been missing. And this alone, there, there have been a couple of key statements that Brad has shared with us today that you can implement this afternoon. And if many of you are going, I want to dive deeper, tell us a little bit about elements. 
Yeah, so we do a two-day workshop, and in the States, we call it the Elements of Closing, and when we do it outside the U.S., we, we, I'll teach it on three other continents this year, um, we call it the Elements of Opening, because there are some cultural changes that need to be made when it's not in the U.S. There are some compliance things that we vet in every country. When I go to Europe, we'll do like four different versions of compliance. Hey, if you're in the U.K., you got to do it this way. If you're over in Ireland, be careful of this. You know, this is countries where there's unregulated. So obviously we know you guys can't take x-rays or whatever the thing is. I've researched all that. So I always speak their language and we get great feedback where docs go, you really know how I practice in my country. That's my job. I have to know how to do that. And what's really cool is you can watch on YouTube how to hit a golf ball, right? There's some amazing golf pros that'll say, you just do this and you pull your elbow and tuck your chin. But that's not the same thing as going to the driving range. You know, you, at some point you have to put in the reps, but they have to be correct reps. So if you're going to create that neoplasticity of the brain, you're going to create that muscle memory. What we do in these workshops is I'll teach for 20 or 30 minutes and stop. And then the docs have to role play it for 10. And I walk around the room and we do corrections. And the reason I call it a workshop is we don't go over 50. So I can make it through the role plays and, and I have one other doc helping me. And so we can coach you through it. And then we'll teach the next chunk. We just chunk it down and then you role play. Chunk it down. So we're creating the muscle memory as we go through. And it's not something we can do on video or I wouldn't travel to do it. You, the doc, have to do this. You have to create that. So it is a two-day workshop. We teach it in Europe. We teach it in South America. Uh, I'll be in Australia a couple times in 2020. And the reason I started going to Australia Honestly, it's just some of the sensitivities within the profession that are going on. Um, some of the issues around communication that have created problems. And I just go, if they just did it this way instead of that way, I know they're well-intended docs, but when you language it that way, you kind of leave yourself exposed. Let's mm -hmm. not do that. So we actually drop the fees when we go to Australia because I want more docs to be communicating at that higher level and really to, to put the confidence back in the doc so they can give good care and not worry about how they're doing it. So um, it is a two day workshop. We do it on different continents. They, day one of the workshop, we just teach how to do the consultation and build value. It is all of that for eight hours. And at the end of it, you'll be ready to go. And then on day two, we teach how to do um, the report of findings in a way where it's the patient's idea. But again, every step of the way, we chunk it down and you role play because we're creating that muscle memory. Yeah, for many of us, you know, we had four or five years at university learning how to, you know, hone our craft to deliver an adjustment that then takes decades after. But nobody, there's two sides of us helping our patients. We can't help them if they don't hang around long enough. If they're, if they're not coming to see us to unwind the lifetime of tension that's built up on the spine. I, I've had a number of uh, practitioners, docs reach out to me, Brad, who have done your course uh mm. and have just beamed um you know michael recently Charlton, he just loved it there too so um and i've i've experienced enough of your stuff over the last 15 years to know what i like about you you're still in practice you're you've got a laboratory there that, that sees how this it works also i'll um i'll pop some links in the show notes um, for our listeners, if you want to find out more about elements, as you mentioned before, you know, we've got a bunch of Aussie listeners. You're heading over to Perth in end of February, a little bit later than that. You're back here in Melbourne. Um, you're all over the US and the UK uh, as, as well. So I'll have some links inside of there too. Buddy, any final thoughts that you'd like to leave our listeners with as we kind of wind up this episode? Yeah, I mean, you know, honestly, looking at uh, like the culture in Australia for chiropractic, there's some awesome leaders there. I would include you in that for sure. You mentioned Martin Harvey, one of my good friends, communication genius. And there's been this, um, you know, time where chiropractic has really gone through a transformation of having to be live at seminars to get information to things being online. Um, and there's kind of a hybrid in between. And I think sometimes no matter what the genre is for chiropractors, you can feel like you're on your own island. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes when you fall into that, I'm just doing my own thing. You create bad habits. You fall off the, the belief system a little bit. You become a bit blase with the testimonials and the great changes. And so what I like to do is kind of pull all those elements in. And again, the reason we take this to other continents, we charge less when we leave the U S it's a greater cost to us. I genuinely want chiropractors working at a higher level. Perth is not in the neighborhood for me. 
you know, we got to take a flight to Melbourne, which is like 16 hours from LA and then hop across the country another four hours, whatever it is to Perth. I'm honestly doing that because I want to help docs. And I know we have the solution. We have docs that have been doing this for decades. And sometimes they have to unlearn their bad habits. Yeah. And we really create an environment where they can do that. And we've got a huge contingent of recent grads that are going to learn it the right way the first time around. And chiropractic is doing well in Australia because of guys like you, because of groups like the ASRF um, that are really helping chiropractors vitalistically around the globe. So mm. the short answer to this is, you know, it's well-intentioned for the recipients. I, I want docs to be doing better by their own definition. And there's only one way to do that. We got to, we got to create some new habits and stop the bad habits. And that happens in a two day workshop. Yeah. But look, I can vouch for your generosity um, across the board. The work that you've done with, you know, when I was a part of the spinal research foundation is um, it's hard to overstate just how generous Brad is with his time, with his finances, with his knowledge also. So Gang, head on over to the show notes, adiomedia.com forward slash podcast. You'll find the notes for this. I'll have some links where you can kind of find out a little bit more about Brad, where you can reach out to him on the socials and where you can find out more about Elements also. Buddy, thanks so much for joining us today. This will be a two or three time listener. There's some statements in there that are absolutely gold that, you know, for our listeners and watchers here too, just start to put this into play. It's not complicated. It doesn't have to be complicated as well, buddy. So... On behalf of all my crew to yours, buddy, thanks so much for all that you do. I uh, appreciate it, pal. And next time we hook up, let's talk some lacrosse. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> I look forward to it, mate. Take care. See you soon. All right, buddy. Take care. Bye. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, you have to come and check out the Community Influencer Program. It's my monthly coaching program where we take all this material and I'll work one-on-one -on -one with you to apply, implement, systematize, and help guide you and your practice to the next level. Now, you can join me on over at adiomedia.com forward slash join. That's adiomedia.com forward slash join. I'd love to see you in there.